welcome to lesson 13, which is Christ in the Crucible. Um, Israel and myself are here this evening to present the lesson to you, and we hope that you glean something for us from it that will draw you closer to Christ. So before we start the lesson, Israel is going to go ahead and open with prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for um, coming to this earth and give, give, uh, give, giving us salvation and uh, a way for us to have eternal life. Uh, be with us and help us understand and explain the lesson to everybody that's going to hear from us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, lesson 13, Christ in the Crucible. So we start out with our memory text, which is found in Matthew 27, 46. And it reads, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So whenever we look at this issue and the issue of suffering, the question always comes, how did sin and suffering first arise? Was it through divine revelation that we have good answers? They arose because free beings abused the freedom God had given them. So how do we go about abusing the freedom that God has given us? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think we abuse it every day, right? Just, but how? Just by not doing what we should. Or by, for example, uh, just abusing our body, right? Maybe uh, eating what we shouldn't or drinking what we shouldn't. And we, we abuse our body and because our body is a temple of God, right? Yeah. That, that's an example. So do we also abuse that freedom by not living up to the expectation God has, God has for us? Yeah. Right? By not putting him first, by, you know, there, there's a multitude of ways, right? And so, you know, the, the message is pretty clear. You know, when we abuse that freedom, we, we are abusers of self and our relationship with Christ. So, when we live a selfish lifestyle and we don't put Christ first, then we're abusing that freedom. So, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up, you know, in, in the world that we're a part of. Very easy. I find myself getting caught up in it all the time. But I feel the Holy Spirit call me and plead with me, basically, you know, to spend time. Time in study, time in prayer, time, just time. You know, because without that time, without that connection, we lose that strength. You know, we lose that, that ability to be able to commune with God. You know, and that's what a lot of this lesson was kind of talking about, too, was the fact, and we get into it later on, I think in Wednesday or Thursday, where Christ was feeling distant from his Father. All right? Because of the sin that had now entered that he was now surrounded by. 
So, you know, we'll get more into this, but I mean, ultimately, he, he, felt, he felt forsaken basically because he felt distant, right? He felt disconnected, mm -hmm. right? He was, he was preparing, you know, to die for well, our sins. And that's what happens to us when we give in to sin, right? Yeah. We, we distance ourselves from our Creator. And we suffer a slow death in the process right we don't realize it all the time all right we don't we don't think about that aspect of things but we are in fact dying mm -hmm. um, so there was one question I highlighted here where it talked about um, it said did God know beforehand that this that these beings being us the human beings would fall and the answer obviously is yes right mm -hmm. you know but as c.s lewis wrote his saving of us his intervention on our behalf his dying was worth the risk mm -hmm. right it was worth going through that ag that agony that separation, that that disconnectedness from his father. I don't think any of us can really relate. I don't. I don't believe. You know, we can study about it. We can read about it. But to relate to that aspect of things, how painful that was. That's really hard to sum up into words, and to really understand as human beings. I, I think the only way we can kind of understand that it, the risk was worth it was like as parents we decide to have kids and we know where they're where they're coming right they're coming to this earth and we know that they might get out of church or do this or that and but at the end I think as a parent, it's worth the risk because you learn to love him or love her and you take care of them. And there's it's this love that you feel for each of your kids that it's worth even the pain they bring you sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah it is. It said here, it said, God chose to bear in himself the brunt of the suffering caused by our abuse of freedom. And we see this suffering in the life and death of Jesus, who through suffering in our flesh has created bonds between heaven and earth that will last throughout eternity. And again, I don't think that's something that we really, in our finite minds and bodies, can truly comprehend. But I think we will at some point in time. But we're just not, we just can't do it yet. But it really is, is important that we understand just what Christ gave up on our behalf and how much suffering he went through on our behalf. And it wasn't just the aspect of dying on the cross as, as painful and agonizing as that part of it was. That was only a portion of the overall picture. So moving on to Sunday... The early days and it said that um, the scripture gives us little information about the early years of Jesus a few verses however tell us something about those conditions and the kind of world the Savior entered and those are found in, in um, Luke 2 7 22 through 24 um, Leviticus 12 6 through 8 and Matthew 2 1 through 18 we encourage you to read those um, that'll bring to you a, bit, a little better understanding of just what um, this kind of what this really entailed, you know, for for Jesus during this time period. Um, but it did go on to say that Jesus was not the first person to live in poverty or to face those who wanted to kill him. And you think about that for a moment, you know. And I don't think it's it's really dawned on me until I read the lesson tonight, but it was, again, 
before Jesus was even born, he was being hunted. Right? And then, even after he was born, he was still being hunted. And it wasn't like he was born into the lap of luxury by any means. He was born into abject poverty. Right? And there are so many aspects of his life that when we look at them in greater detail, we understand, I think, more and more thoroughly just what he endured for us. That he didn't have to. By any means, he didn't have to do any of this. But it was his personal choice, right? He, he could have also chose to be born into a nice, rich family, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it, it was a very unique um, episode, I guess, in time, and we I encourage all of us to really get a better understanding of what that really meant, and the suffering that Christ endured on, on our behalf. And, um, well, and also talks about his, uh, well, I guess since the since his childhood all the way to adulthood, how he was different than everybody else and he probably had would might have been like picked on a lot because he was different he wasn't like the other kids well isn't that isn't that very similar to the whole to i guess to a certain degree at least our own experience when we choose to follow christ we in a lot of instances can be picked on or we can be ostracized because of our choices mm -hmm. you know that 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 ostracizing effect can come from your own family in certain cases your friends your co-workers right they don't understand they don't want to understand in a lot of cases they don't want to they don't want to change their lifestyle and their habits just because you do mm -hmm. right and you know, it's it's or, um, or they think they have to because you don't. But that that's not what we're asking. We're just letting them know that we don't do that, and that's it. But then sometimes they feel offended because you tell them. Yeah, they feel <laughs> they feel offended. They feel put off. They feel like it's like you're trying to force change on them, mm -hmm. and, and that's never the intent, right? But you know, it's it's just it's hard for people to rationalize why you can't be worldly like they are worldly right and it's not always the case obviously i mean there are there are instances where people can see the change in you and wish to emulate that change right but it's not always that case it's 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 hard and it's obviously different for every person that's out there but it can be a very painful reckoning i guess you know per se for each each of us um it's worthwhile absolutely you know but it's not easy but i guess the big thing is that we're not in it alone right god will not step away from us as we're going through these challenges but we have to choose to include him and ask him for that guidance in that direction Um, so I thought this, this next section here on the bottom of Sunday was, um, interesting because it said, even in our hardness because of sin, we ourselves often shrink away from exposure to sins and evil that we find repulsive. Imagine what it must have been like for Christ whose soul was pure who wasn't the least bit tainted by sin. Think of the sharp contrast between himself and others around him in that regard. It must have been exceedingly painful for him. It says, ask yourself, how sensitive am I to the sins that exist all around us? Do they bother me or am I hardened to them? Number one, 
And then number two, if you are hardened to them, could it be because of the things you read, watch, or even do? So first thing is, are you hardened as a result of your exposure to the sins that surround you? Can you answer that? Could I answer? I think probably in some sense, sometimes, I think everybody is. You see somebody doing something and you're just like, oh, that's normal. It happens all the time, so you just don't feel anything, right? Like, for example, you hear so much, like, there was an earthquake in Mexico, uh, like, a day or two days ago. And I was like, oh, that, that's bad, but, well, it's normal. Because you hear it so many times. And we should actually feel bad or sad for those people that are maybe suffered or for that earthquake i guess but i think the, the bigger question here is when we experience sin on an individual level it's very easy as individuals if you participate in that sin through repetition to become hardened to that sin. Oh yeah, that too. Okay, so. Well, that's because on the question, it was how sensitive am I to the sins that exist all around us? Yeah. So. So, but I mean. But yeah, and making it more personal. Yeah, every time you do something and you continually do it, it becomes normal. You don't feel bad about it, right? Maybe the first time you did it, you kind of feel bad. But, but then it, you it, do it, it again. It becomes commonplace. Yeah. Right. It becomes justifiable, mm -hmm. you know, in your mind. You know, so I think about, and I know I've, I've raised this point before in, in other lessons, video games. Mm -hmm. I think, at least it's my personal belief anyway, that when kids play a lot of these very graphic video mm -hmm. games, they become desensitized to the act that they're performing. performing. Mm -hmm. And through that process, I see how, at least there can be a connection in my mind between performing that act in a video game to performing that act in real life. Yeah, and things are becoming more real now. You know? Even in... It becomes no big thing to pick up a gun and shoot somebody because you've done it so many times and you see the blood and the guts and the gore and everything else on your screen that it doesn't, it's not, there's no emotional connection anymore. There's no, there's no horror to, to what you're actually physically partaking in, right? Yeah. So that's what, what I, I, that's what I got out of this question was, was, do we become hardened or desensitized to the occurrence or to the to the happening? Mm. You know, by participating in it. So anyway, that that's that's a, a definite point of, of discussion. You know, both both here and to our watchers out there and listeners this evening, um, feel free uh, to send us your comments on that. You know, either if you agree with us or don't agree with us or what you think, but. Ultimately, you know, the more that we partake in these things, the more that we do these things, regardless of what they are, you know, um, sin is sin. Mm -hmm. So if you do it and you do it enough times, it becomes part of who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's no longer something that... You see as bad. As bad. So... Um, but I think that wraps up that question. Let's see. Sunday. Okay. Anything else for Sunday before we move to Monday? Mm -hmm. All right. Monday's lesson. Um, despised and rejected of men. It talks about here in this part of the lesson, whether by leaders or even by the common people, Jesus' life, acts, and teachings were constantly misunderstood 
leading to rejection and hatred by people who came, he came to save. It goes on and says, in a certain sense, it must be like a parent who sees a wayward child in need of help. This is kind of what you were talking about earlier. And though the parent is willing to give everything for that child, the child spurns the parent, heaping scorn and rejection upon perhaps the only person who can spare that child from utter ruin. That's what Jesus faced while here on earth. How painful it must have been for him. So... Um, I, I've spoken in the past a little bit about, you know, our youngest adopted son. And I can tell you, from experience, I can relate to this. Because um, our youngest son went through a lot. You know, he went through a lot of um, poor choices that led him down a path that he's still paying for today. Um, certainly... We tried to spare him from going down that road. We told him what it would lead to. Um, but like a lot of youth today, uh, a lot of youth will, will tell you that, you know, I, I hear you, but I'm going to experience this on my own, or I don't believe you, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And it's hard as a parent to sit and watch your child go down that road, all right? And you try and try and try to stop them, to, to, to get them to make a, a change. But it doesn't always take effect. And that's a very painful process to endure. So I, I can relate in a lot of aspects to that. Um, I know you talked about um, wanting to do whatever you could do to be able to protect your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. And you can elaborate that on that if you wish, but... No, I think... Well, my kids are young, so I still don't have that much experience. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you, you as a parent, you always want to protect them. E even as young, young, young as my kids are, especially my oldest one, Sometimes I have to tell him to don't jump from there because you're going to get hurt. But he doesn't listen and he still jumps. And then he's like, oh, wow, should I hurt my, my foot or something? I'm like, oh, I told you not to. <laughs> but yeah. And, but like we said, or like, like what God thought or said, uh, it, was, it was worth it, right? You love them and you do whatever you want. You can to protect them. Yes, absolutely. I think that's our that's our position in life. That's our job in life. But it doesn't make it an easy job or an easy position. Um, um, and and I think uh, Jesus was in that position, but it was like ten times or more worse than what we feel with our kids. I believe. Oh, oh, absolutely. A lot more. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of what it's telling us on Monday's lesson. Well, it talks also here about the pain of rejection, you know, and I think we've all felt um, in our lives, we've all felt what that what that's like, um, you know, whether that be through personal relationship, whether that be through family relationship, um, whatever. I mean, there's... It hurts. It hurts a lot to be rejected, whether it's for whatever reason, you know. But I, I guess, and and we're 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 just trying we're trying to set the groundwork basically for what it was like for Jesus, and and we, I don't think any of us can really relate to what that really was like for him. All we can do is relate in our own personal experience what it would look, would be like for us oh yeah and well the lesson also talks uh the this uh, it gives us some examples uh, in the bible about how people from his own where he was raised were like well really can anything good come from there or or like when he was talking to the 
uh, at the what's it called the temple and they just took him out and were trying to <coughs> throw him down the hill right and like it was his own people his own Jewish people the ones that he had saved from Egypt from from all those bad things and there were the the ones that were rejecting him right and I think uh, even from an arts perspective especially when it's our own family that's rejecting us I think uh, it hurts the most yeah yeah it certainly it certainly does because that's a much closer personal relationship to us and this is how I believe Christ must have felt when it was his own people mm -hmm. you know his own some of whom he knew very well and they still effectively just turned on him um, I did have some some notes here to read on, on this that I had highlighted and it said that understand the truth of rejections the rejection that comes from believing in Christ is a very per, is very personal in nature. It feels as though you are being rejected for who you are, and it can be very painful. However, it's important to remember that ultimately it is Christ who is being rejected. You are being despised because you have chosen to follow him. We must remember, we must know that God empathizes with our pain. Jesus knows exactly how it feels to be rejected. After all, he was rejected by his own family. That's why he promised to encourage us, Paul said. Praise be to the God and Father of our <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And we must remember that you are not alone. We are not alone. Rejection can leave you feeling lonely and isolated. God knows this, and he has promised to be with us through everything. All we have to do is choose to ask. There is a great comfort in knowing that no matter how many people reject you, God will never leave you or forsake you. <clears throat> Anything else to add? No. You're very easy tonight, Israel. <laughs> Tuesday, Jesus in Gethsemane. I think it's... It goes on here and it says that whatever Jesus suffered throughout his 33 years here on earth, nothing compared to what he started to face in the last hour before the cross. From the eternal ages, the sacrifice of Jesus as the offering of the world's sin was planned, and now it was all coming to pass. So, you know, we look at this and all of the time, as it's saying here, all of the time of those first 33 years of his life, uh, definitely weren't easy definitely had a lot of trials a lot of tribulations um, a lot of personal grief um, a lot of episodes in his life where he felt deserted and he felt um, disillusioned to a certain degree and that's more so at least by the personal relationships that he had okay and i think like it is with us we have a certain level of expectation for those that we call our friends and when they don't meet that level of expectation we're hurt right and we feel set aside so I think that's probably very simplistic terms part of this, but none of that, none of all of those first almost 33 years of his life compared to those last few hours as he was heading towards the cross. All right? And it, it gets pretty heavy and pretty deep as we start reading on 
Gethsemane and as he's entering and what he's going through while he's there and how he's trying to depend upon the disciples to do certain things for him and they weren't able to even do, the, do them. Stay praying. <laughs> they couldn't stay praying. They couldn't stay awake. They couldn't, you know, the very simple things that he wanted them to do, they couldn't even do those things. What he was teaching them for the last three years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, well, at least for me, I think this part is the hardest part to explain to others because well we don't know exactly how he felt we just know it was really bad but we've never <clears throat> been through something like this so it, it's hard to to imagine what he felt well those three paragraphs at the end of tuesday um we should read do you want to read those which one um where it starts with, he went a little distance from them. Okay. It says, he went a little distance from them, not so far, but that they could both see and hear him and felt prostrate, prostrate upon the ground. He felt that by sin, he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep that his spirit shredded, shredded before it. This agony he must not exert, his divine power to escape. As men, he must suffer the consequences of men's sin. As men, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. Then it goes on and said, Christ was now standing in a different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. His suffering can best be described in the words of the prophet, Awake, O sword! against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 13, 7. As the substitute and surety for a sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto he had been as an intercessor for others. Now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. So it goes on and says, dwell upon what was happening to Jesus in Gethsemane. Already the sins of the world were starting to fall upon him. Try to imagine what that must have been like. No human being has ever been called to go through anything like this before or since. What does this tell us about God's love for us? What hope can you draw from this for yourself? Any comments? Well, on the question, what hope can you draw from this for yourself? Well, I think uh, I'm glad that he, he chose to die for us. And just by all through this lesson, the hope is that, well, he died for us and now we're going to live forever thanks to him. Um, but you know, know. I, I, you read in that first paragraph, and it's hard, I, I really think it's hard for us as human beings to really grasp this. But because Christ was one with his Father, and he was connected on such a deep spiritual, physical, emotional level with his Father much more so than any of us can even begin to understand. And then it said, he was now feeling separated from his father. And it says the gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. And I know those are words on paper, but that's... When you start thinking about that and what that must have been like for him, that's that's even that's just that's um, it's almost impossible to comprehend in our finite minds. But that level of being separated, you know, I can only I can only think of it as I would. I 
I, I can't even come close. But I mean, to, to even, I can only think of him, you know, physically shaking, shuddering, feeling lost. Yeah, not not knowing what to do, just going with the with whatever's gonna happen. I yeah, don't but know. but not even not even really understand. I mean, I'm sure he understood what was about to happen, but I, I don't think he could come to terms with what was about to, to happen. He had to trust and have faith in his father that he would see him through it. Hmm. And that's a level of trust and faith that you and I can't even begin to understand. Yeah, and then we see, well, in another day we see it's so bad that he asks his father if he can to stop it, right? Yeah. That's how bad it is. But you hear him say right here in this last paragraph in the Desire of Ages, he had been an intercessor for others, and now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. All right, this is our intercessor, the one we are depending upon for us. And he's now saying he wants an intercessor for himself. Now, those, those, that's that's a very powerful, powerful and descriptive sentence. I don't know. That's that's really really worthy of additional study. So again, we we encourage you um, spend some time in this because there's a lot to be learned. Um, and that quote, as we said, just came from The Desire of Ages, page 686. Anyway, going into Wednesday, the crucified God. Death by crucifixion was one of the harshest punishments the Romans meted out to anyone. It was considered the worst way to die. Thus, how horrific for anyone to be killed that way in particular, the Son of God. Jesus, we must always remember, came in human flesh like ours. Between the beatings, the scourgings, the nails hammered into his hands and feet, the harrowing weight of his own body tearing at the wounds, the physical pain, all must have been unbearable. This was harsh, even for the worst of criminals. How unfair, then, that Jesus, innocent of everything, should face such a fate. Yet, as we know, Christ's physical sufferings were mild in contrast to what was really happening. This is more than just the killing of an innocent man. So, if you look at Matthew 27, 45. Matthew 27, 45 says, it starts by saying, and this is the day of crucifixion, obviously. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. 46 says, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Lema Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me or forsaken me? So, if we move on to 27, 51 and 52, um, says 51, at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. So we look at these verses, and I think Mark 15 and 38 basically repeats Matthew 27, 45. But, oh, I'm sorry, did I get that wrong? Mark 15, 38. Did I do that wrong? Mark 15, 38. 1538 says, um, and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So, <clears throat> if you put yourself in that position, 
and as was common in those days, everybody would amass basically to watch the crucifixion. Okay, I'm sure people had seen more than one crucifixion in the past, right? So, mind you, I don't think I'd want to see more than one, but you know, if one at all. But ultimately, the crucifixion event is occurring, but all of a sudden, while it's occurring, the sky turns black, the ground shakes, earthquakes, right? Mm -hmm. Graves rip open, people, I mean, that should tell you there's something... Something unnatural is <laughs> happening. Something unnatural is <laughs> happening, right? But I, I thought this was interesting too, and again, you know, we, we read this, we read this verse that says um, in Matthew um, 2745, I'm sorry, no, 5152. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So do you understand what the curtain I'm sure you understand what the curtain was, right? Right? The separation yeah, point, separation. right? But the curtain itself was roughly 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and the curtain was four inches thick. Solid curtain woven four inches thick. And it was ripped completely in two from top to bottom. Yeah, and, and then it's top to bottom. It's not even bottom to top. You know? So. <laughs> but I mean, what message should this be sending to people? God is mad. Well, <laughs> you know, but I mean, obviously this wasn't this is not a, human. a normal thing that was occurring. Mm -hmm. And it goes on, it says, Clearly something much more was happening here than just the death, however unfair, of an innocent man. According to Scripture, God's wrath against sin, our sin, was poured out upon Jesus. Did you get that? God's wrath was poured out on his son. His wrath against sin. Our sin. Jesus on the cross suffered a righteous God's righteous indignation against sin. The sins of the whole world. As such, Jesus suffered something deeper, darker, and more painful than any human being could ever know or experience. That's important. Because, quite honestly, I think most people read this, and it's a story to them. It's a happening. It's an occurrence. It's okay. Christ died on the cross. But it was much more than that. And I've got to believe that when we do make it to heaven at some point in time, when we do finally make it to heaven, we're truly going to understand this for what it was and the sacrifice that it represented. But to have experienced that event, to have seen and witnessed that event, there's no way you could have walked away from that and said, this was what a mistake. another human being just the, the, killed. <laughs> yeah, this, this wasn't just a normal occurrence. This wasn't just an, an individual. This was far more than that. Well, I'm pretty sure there, there was a couple more people, like the soldier, that realized that God was gone there at the cross. Yeah. I, I, at least I would like to imagine that. That wasn't just the soldier that realized who was being killed that day. And I, I, got, I, I think... I gotta believe that if people were truthful, 
they would have realized that what they did was terrible. I mean, that's 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 a mild word, but it, you know. Well, the priests, I'm pretty sure they. They tried to they, cover it up. They understood, it, especially when all this thing happened. It was just they didn't want to let go of the material things of this earth. So they decided not to ignore it, I, I guess. Well, they went out of their way, too, to try to cover it up and make, make it go away as quietly as possible. Anyway, um, moving on to Thursday. The suffering God. And it says, we might as well get used to it. As long as we are here in this world, we are going to suffer. As fallen creatures, it is our fate. Nothing in the Bible promises us anything different. On the contrary. It says, in the midst of our sufferings, two things we should keep in mind. First, Christ our Lord has suffered worse than any of us ever could at the cross. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53, 4. What we know only as individuals, he suffered corporately for us all. He who was sinless became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Suffering in a way that we, as sinful creatures, couldn't begin to imagine. But second... As we suffer, we should remember the results of Christ's suffering. That is, what we have been promised through what Christ has done for us. And we encourage you to read John 10, 28, Romans 6, 23, Titus 1, 2, and John 1, sorry, 1 John 2, 25, to look at those promises. Whatever our sufferings here, thanks to Jesus, thanks to his bearing in himself the punishment of our sin, thanks to the great provision of the gospel, that through faith we can stand perfect in Jesus right now, we have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise that because of what Christ has done, because of the fullness and completeness of his perfect life and perfect sacrifice, our existence here, full of pain, disappointment, and loss, is no more than an instant, a flash, here and gone, in contrast to the eternity that awaits us, an eternity in a new heaven and a new earth, one without sin, suffering, and death. And all this is promised to us and made certain for us only because of Christ and the crucible he went into, so that one day coming soon he would see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Any comments on that? Mm. Um, I just don't care how much I suffer as long as <laughs> I know I can go through those gates and have eternal life <laughs> and I think that's how we should all think right oh yeah I agree um, let's see here so There were, there was a section here on Friday, which I'm going to go ahead and read before we can close up. But it, it, it says here that, and this is coming from um, the Desire of Ages, I think it's chapter 74 on Gethsemane. And it says, three times has he uttered that prayer. Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate, and his decision is made he will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood that through his, him perishing, millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory 
to save the one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. And he will not turn his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that is willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. But it goes on in 74, and I added this section because I thought it was very important. And it says, having made this decision, or the decision, he fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. Where now were his disciples? To place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their fainting master. This is talking while he's in Gethsemane. He's asking them to pray and, and basically support him. And they're at, he's, he says, And bathe that brow, marred indeed more than the sons of men. The Savior trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld and this is where we talk about if we could lift that curtain up and we could really see what was going on around him angels beheld the savior's agony they saw the lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces his nature weighed down with a shuddering mysterious dread there was silence in heaven no harp was touched could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son? They would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. So, I know that's heavy. I know that causes a lot of introspection and a lot of personal I guess personal thought, introspection, personal thought is to a desire to really look at who we are and why we do what we do. Um, why we shouldn't do what we sh we do. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying it, it's analyzing our lives yes and who we are and how we act and what we tend to try to justify behavior but if there's ever a time to really think about what God endured for us what he gave up for us the pain the suffering all of it you know that 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 last paragraph really kind of sums it all up. And especially the fact that when it talks about the Lord God pouring out his indignation on his own son because he was in truly dying for our sins. And, you know, I know me personally, I have a lot of growth that I still have to do. You know, there are things that I still have to overcome in my own life. And I know I guess what I'm trying to say is I owe it to Christ to put forth my best effort to make sure I can overcome those things. And I know that if I can't do them, I know I can do them with Him. My own strength is going to be insufficient. Right? Mm -hmm. We have no way of overcoming the wiles of the devil. It's just not within our capability. But with Christ, with his strength, he is able. And that's all we have to worry about. So, anything else to add? Mm -hmm. You were very quiet tonight, Israel. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed um, the lesson this evening. And as we said earlier, if you have any questions, um, 
reach out on our Facebook page, uh, contact us, and we will be sure and glad to be able to follow back up with you. But in closing, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And we thank you um, for your time. Uh, whenever you're watching this, we thank you. And uh, we look forward to meeting with you again next week. Heavenly Father, Lord, this was an opportunity to be able to discuss this week's Sabbath School lesson. And we thank you for this chance to study and to dialogue, Lord, and to convey the thoughts of this lesson, Lord Jesus, to those who are able to watch. So we ask, Heavenly Father, for you to continue to work in our lives and in the lives of all those who are watching this recording, Lord Jesus. And we ask that you please be with the, each and every one of us, that you forgive us of our sin, Lord, and that you help us, Heavenly Father, to guide us and direct us through the lives that you have blessed us with in all of the dealings that come upon us. We just ask that you give us the strength, Lord Jesus, to come to you and to seek your presence and to ask, Lord, that you will lift us up and allow us to be able to um, meet all of the expectations of the day that is before us and to do it in such a way that we bring you honor and glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Be with us, watch over us, and protect us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.